the Kennedy years. So again, this would be following, following Dwight Eisenhower. Um, John Kennedy's going to get elected. And again, young president, youngest president to ever be elected, Democrat. Um, and talking about kind of what happens here with um, his presidency in the Cold War. Um, in coming chapters, when we talk more about the, the civil rights movement and, and things of that nature, um, we will talk, we'll speak more about civil rights and that kind of thing and the little bit that he did get done while he was in office. Again, President Kennedy sadly gets um, assassinated early on into, into his first term. But um, one of the big things that Kennedy promised, and he was a, an awesome speaker, like that is something that is well known about, about Kennedy was his public speaking skills. And one of the big promises that he had made to the people of the United States was that um, the United States, despite the fact that the Soviets had beaten us to space in 1957 with the launching of Sputnik, um, he promised that the United States and the first human in 1961, he promised that the United States would win the race to the moon. Okay, that was kind of his, his big, bold promise to the people of the United States is that we were going to win the, the space race in the sense that we would go to the moon first, okay, which was kind of an unthinkable thing at the time. Um, in 1969, right, Neil Armstrong and the boys, they make it to the moon. It was not shot in a Hollywood theater as, despite the, the beliefs of some. Um, the United States, and as a matter of fact, made it to the moon. And under, under Kennedy, right, NASA had been created in the late 50s under the Eisenhower administration, but Kennedy kind of took it over the top, um, put a lot more money into NASA. That was one of the, I guess, big spending initiatives that, that he kind of took on, um, that he kind of took on. And so under Kennedy, this is where NASA becomes very well funded. That's our, our uh, space program, right? So that's something here to keep in mind. Okay. Um, as far as kind of just some other things here, whereas President Eisenhower had called for like a, a policy of mass retaliation, if the United States ever found themselves kind of in a spot where they were under attack, whether it was a nuclear attack or however, and Eisenhower called for a massive retaliation, so being bigger, better bombs, Kennedy focused more so on what was called flexible response. Um, he wanted the United States to have a variety of defense options rather than just the use of nuclear weapons. So one of the big things that Kennedy does um, as far as this, uh, defense spending is he develops the Special Forces or the Green Beret uh, branch of our, of our army that could be used for you know certain kind of very um, important military operations where some stealthiness was required. So that was one of the things that Kennedy did. And the other thing that we do see happen under Kennedy is we see increased participation in what was happening in Vietnam. And again, that's something else that we will discuss as a separate subject. But again, Vietnam is a country in Southeastern Asia and it, it's been communist here now since 1975. But that was something where the United States, we got, I don't want to say, uh, maybe overly involved. We got very involved there and it became kind of a very... Um, controversial thing, but Kennedy was a believer in what was called the domino theory, that if one nation became communist, that the other nations around it would also become communist. So by preventing the spread of communism to one nation, we would also prevent the spread of communism to the surrounding nations, right, that, that border it. And so we do see under the Kennedy administration, we do see increased participation in Vietnam. Um, and we will really see that from the beginning of his presidency in 1960, um, all the way into the 1970s. So the United States got more and more involved in Vietnam as, as the years went on. Okay. Um, other thing to talk about here is Cuba. Um, shortly before Kennedy took office, um, Cuba, there was a communist revolution there. Fidel Castro is going to overthrow the, the dictator that was in place before him, um, before Cuba was communist. So this all happens in 1959, um, kind of similar to some of the Soviet leaders like a V.I. Lenin or a Joseph Stalin, some of the early communist leaders of Russia. Fidel Castro also makes these promises that, you know, we are going to be, you know, our economy is going to be better. We're not going to have poverty anymore. We're not going to have homelessness anymore. And kind of the, some of the same, I guess you could say, promises that were made by Soviet leaders to the people of the Soviet Union. Um, Fidel Castro then also openly welcomed Soviet aid um, to Cuba, you know, money, 
guns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and again, Cuba is about 90 miles from the United States. So it's very close in proximity to us. So this was kind of a, um, an instance of very high concern for the United States because of the fact that Cuba was so close in proximity to us. Like no longer is this a, um, is this nation a, a communist nation that we are divided by the Atlantic Ocean by, or it's half a world away. I mean, Cuba's like in our own backyard. So this is something where there was a lot of tension um, between the United States, between Cuba and the Soviet Union over this. Um, when Cuba became communist, the United States kind of cut off all of our relations with them, right? So that's something that's actually kind of a, a more recent event is that for the longest time, the United States had an embargo on Cuba where we didn't, you know, do any trade with them whatsoever. And a big part of that is goes back to what had happened in the 1950s and 1960s when Cuba became communist and Fidel kind of, Fidel Castro started taking some of the American owned farms and such and breaking them up and giving them to the poor people of, of Cuba and such. So, um, but Fidel Castro does start a very well, well-known relationship, diplomatic relationship with Nikita Khrushchev. Um, Khrushchev was the, the Soviet premier, I guess, or the Soviet chairman that replaces Joseph Stalin after his death. And so him and Khrushchev had a pretty tight relationship where Khrushchev like openly gave aid to openly gave aid to Cuba. And it was something that made the United States obviously very alarmed. And there was a lot of tension that stemmed from this. Okay. Um, two other things here to understand, because some of the most tense moments of the Cold War do involve Cuba. I'd say the, the two most intense moments of the Cold War involve Cuba. The first one is the Bay of Pigs operation. And this is something that had taken place very early on into Kennedy's presidency, um, you know, like a, the first year of his presidency in 1961. And basically what this was is, you know, starting under the Eisenhower administration is they had started training Cuban exiles, those who had left Cuba after Cuba became communist. The CIA had started training these exiles to invade Cuba um, to overthrow Castro because the United States decided that, well, our army can't invade Cuba because then that's an act of war that has a very negative connotation to it. So kind of the, the attitude was that if Cuban exiles are invading Cuba, well, then it, it, it wasn't the United States, even though the United States did aid them in our air force, um, did have a presence during this. But anyways, um, this Bay of Pigs invasion was a huge disaster. It was supposed to be this you know, well thought out, highly organized operation. It didn't end up working out that way. It was a huge disaster for the United States. Um, Kennedy, you know, didn't really know much about it because he had just become president. And then that's when the CIA said we should, you know, we should go for this. So it was one of those things that it ended up being um, a botched, a very botched military operation. And it did not do anything to obviously help the relationship between the United States and Cuba or the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, and later on, what's going to happen is Kennedy is actually going to, you know, give like 50 million bucks to Cuba to free some of the um, exiles and some of the U.S. military officers that were imprisoned as a result of this. But this was a very bad look for Kennedy, um, especially early on into his presidency. Um, publicly, he does come out and he takes the blame for everything that had happened and, and that it was his fault and, and that sort of thing. But kind of privately, he was like, you know, the CIA, we pay you all this money to do all this investigating. Like, how how could this fail so badly? So this was kind of like the first the first example here of uh, a very high, high stress, high tension um, moment within our Cold War. Um the other one, and this is probably the closest the United States ever got to engaging in in nuclear war, um, was the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, in the summer of 1962, U.S. spy planes had kind of had found out that the Soviet Union had been transporting nuclear missiles to Cuba. Right, that the Soviet Navy was bringing in missiles to Cuba. Um, to store them there. And it was kind of like one of those things to maybe put the United, to get the United States on our, our toes a little bit um, because the United States had also been housing nuclear missiles in places like Turkey, which is very close to the Soviet Union as well um, at this time. And so it was kind of like the Soviet Union's way of, you know, being defensive, I guess, if you want to say that. Um, 
but the United States had this had you know visual confirmation that the Soviet Union had been um, storing these missiles or had started storing these missiles and building launch sites in Cuba. And so that is something where, you know, Kennedy was like, you know, kind of, you know, had to make a really tough choice. It was, do we invade Cuba? And, you know, little, little be known to us history is actually, you know, in Florida, the United States assembled the biggest invasion force of all time, you know, like on call, ready to go. If something were to happen over a hundred thousand troops, um, bigger, it would have been bigger than the, than the units that stormed the beach that Normandy in world war two, luckily it didn't come to that. But instead of invading Cuba, Kennedy made the decision to put a blockade around Cuba, um, using some of the U S using, using the U S naval forces. And, um, that was something obviously that the Soviet union kind of viewed as an act of act of aggression, I guess. Kennedy was kind of saying, well, it's, we're just trying to be defensive here. We know what you guys are doing. And so for about this week long time, about six days, um, the United States, our, our death con meter dropped again. So it was kind of like, you know, the, the closest that we ever got to, to um, nuclear war. But eventually what does happen is Khrushchev and Kennedy are able to work out an agreement where the Soviet Union agrees to remove their missiles from um, to remove their missiles from Cuba and to demolish their launch sites that they had started building um, under a couple conditions that the U.S. promised not to invade Cuba and that we would remove our missiles from Turkey. And so the United States very publicly promised not to invade Cuba. Very secretively, we removed our missiles from Turkey. Um, but again, this was probably the closest either side ever got to pressing the little red button to engage in full-fledged nuclear war. Okay, the other thing here that we have going on, and again, moving kind of from Cuba, moving back to Europe, is during this time of Kennedy's presidency, we also have what's going on in Berlin, Berlin, Germany, um, the city that was located in East Germany, controlled by the Soviet Union. But again, the city of Berlin, you had West Berlin, East Berlin, West Berlin was free and democratic and capitalist, East Berlin was communist and sad. Um, and we saw the construction of the Berlin Wall, right, to divide the two, and, and Kennedy, Kennedy makes the very well-known appearance in Berlin, you know, the Ich ein Berliner speech where, you know, he talks about a unified Berlin and what that would look like. Um, obviously, it's still about 30 years from, from this time when, when that would all happen. But that was just, again, the Berlin Wall is another one of those signs of, of the Cold War and trying to, you know, the tensions between democracy and capitalism and, and communism. Um, Kennedy does uh, die in 1963. Um, but as far as some other things that kind of get done um, around the time of his presidency or shortly thereafter is there is a hotline put in, like the little red phone. That, that was a direct phone line between the White House and the Kremlin where the, um, you know, that, where the Soviet heads are, kind of like their White House, I guess. And that direct phone line was put in so that the two sides could talk day and night if they had to in case of some sort of emergency. Um, only gets used a couple of times throughout the Cold War, but that was something that was put in during Kennedy's administration. Um, also during his administration, they, he does sign what was called the Limited Test Ban or Limited Test Ban Treaty that um, it kind of put a limit on, on uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on nuclear tests within the atmosphere. So it's kind of, again, one of those signs of maybe some, some peace over this that we're not going to try to... Um, blow blow each other up or show off the strength of our weapons within the atmosphere because it was later discovered that nuclear weapons were actually um, really bad for for our for our earth and as far as the atmosphere basically it burns a hole in our atmosphere so that was something else and then um, after he dies is assassinated Lyndon Baines Johnson replaces him and in 1968 the United States and um, the Soviet Union, are going to sign um, what's called the, the NPT Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, and this was something that was signed by a handful of other nations. But basically what this did, and this is kind of an important thing still to this day, is that it that basically this treaty decided which nations could have nuclear weapons and which ones couldn't. And so trying again to, to limit, trying to limit um, which nations could have those and try to, you know, I guess take a step in the right direction of limiting who could have access to nuclear weapons. As as you guys know, that is something that there is still a lot of debate over today. 
um, over which nation should have them versus who shouldn't. You know, we hear a lot about Iran, for example, and Pakistan in recent years, um, and the United Nations trying to limit um, who has access to those types of weapons.